Let's pray. God, lead us to live with compassion, sharing in the suffering of others, and give us hope. In Jesus' name, amen. So our readings today were a real downer. They were rough, and they were raw, and full of grief. But today is Palm Sunday. It's a day we're supposed to be celebrating Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And it's also Passion Sunday. Now that word passion has evolved in its meaning over time. Some of us might say we are passionate about pickleball or golf or something. We have high energy, high emotion around this activity. Or we might use it in kind of an erotic sense and say, I am passionate about this other person. But that is not what the word passion originally meant. It meant suffering. So when we talk about the passion of Jesus, we are not talking about how much Jesus loved us. We are talking about how much Jesus suffered. And there's a big difference. There's so much grief in our readings today that we have to say a little bit about grief before we continue. Things that you all already know. I won't tell you anything new, but maybe I'll remind you of something. And that is that grief is not something we ever get over. You will never get over your grief, but you can get through it. You can process it. And sometimes we get stuck in grief, and we might need some help but we'll still not get over it. We will work and move through it. The other thing to remember about grief is that all change involves grief. All change. If you move from one community to another and you leave friends and neighbors that you loved, or if you change jobs, you go through a period of grief. When your children graduate from high school and they move away to college, parents often grieve or they have a party, depending on the child. But grief is involved. And it's not just when we lose or when a person passes, when somebody dies. Grief can encompass all ages, all walks of life. When my oldest son was in preschool, one week the message was, Jesus grows tall and wise. And the idea was that you will too. By the fourth day of preschool, my son was under the table crying when I picked him up. And it took a while to find out what was happening. He didn't want to grow tall and wise. He just wanted to be a kid. He was grieving his lost childhood, and he was only four. So grief comes in all forms. And in our readings today, we see three different expressions of grief. We have Jesus in the garden, praying, in anguish, bargaining with God. Maybe this cup can pass. Maybe there's a loophole here. Maybe there's another way. I know what's coming, but just maybe, can I have a little bit of hope that it's not going to happen the way I know it will? Then we have Peter in the courtyard. He is trying to be as small and as invisible as he can because he wants to watch what happens to Jesus from a distance. But those servant girls will not leave him alone. They keep poking at him. You knew Jesus. You were with him. You even talk like he does. And Peter denied it and denied it. And finally, he erupts in anger saying, I don't even know the man. Now, anger is another expression of grief. And of course, then the rooster crows, and Peter is plunged into despair, now wondering, is there enough forgiveness? Is there enough mercy? Is there any hope for me after what I just did? And then we have Judas. Now, I know everybody likes to blame Judas, but before you do that, consider Jesus chose Judas to be one of the 12. They were together for more than three years. They were friends. They knew one another well. Judas had a role to play. If Judas did not do what he did, there'd be no Good Friday. And if there was no Good Friday, there would be no Easter. 
Judas played his role. And Jesus even said to him, friend, friend, do what you must. Do what you came to do. And of course, when Judas realizes with sickening clarity that Jesus is not going to get out of this alive, he repents. He is ashamed. He wants to turn back the clock. He wants things to come out differently than they did. And he goes to the priests and the elders. He goes to the church looking for mercy, looking for redemption, looking for a little bit of hope. And they give him nothing. This week, grief came to my house when my mother-in-law passed away. And the days prior to her death and the day of her death, all five of our children were traveling, coming to see us from all over the United States, from the West Coast and from Florida and from Ohio and Iowa and Indiana, and everybody was coming together because they knew that their dad was grieving. And they knew that their grandfather was grieving, and they themselves were grieving, and they all came together. And when they came, our house was filled with energy. We see these kids together usually once a year. To have them all gathered around the table, they're all talking, and they're sharing stories, and they're getting caught up with one another, and they're playing games till the wee hours of the morning. It brought such hope to us. They brought compassion. Now, if passion means grief and suffering, compassion means together with grief and suffering. Compassion says, I see you. I know you're hurting. I cannot fix it. I can't change it. But I can be here. I can be here beside you. That's what compassion is, and that is what we are asked to do as Christians. We cannot be alone when we're grieving. We have to have somebody with us. We need to know that somebody is thinking of us, that somebody is near, somebody sees what we're going through. But in our readings today, Jesus is alone in that garden. His friends can't stay awake. And Peter is the only disciple in the courtyard. And Judas is alone in that field. Now, how different would our stories be today if somebody had been there? How different would it have been for, G for Jesus if Peter and James and John could stay awake? What if they knelt beside him? What if they put their arms around him and prayed for him? How would Jesus' experience have been different? What would have happened for Peter if six or eight of those disciples had been with him in that courtyard instead of him there by himself? What if all together the disciples were watching Jesus from afar when those servant girls said, hey, you were with Jesus, you were a friend of his? What if they all stood up and said, yes, we were. We are his friends. He is our teacher, and he is the finest person we know. How would Peter's story have ended differently? And Judas, what different ending would he have had if when he went to the priests and he, when he went to the elders and he was looking for mercy and redemption and forgiveness and hope, what if just one of them, just one priest had said to him, we cannot undo what's been done, but we will pray for you. Come inside and we will wait with you. What if Judas had stayed alive long enough to hear Jesus' words on the cross when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How would Judas' story have ended then? What a difference compassion makes when we see someone else's suffering and we partner with them and we just let them know that we're there. We are still there. We are with them. We can't change it. We can't fix it. But we can be there. We can be present. 
in one of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, there's a story shared by Gail Sellers. Gail and her husband live in the United States, and her father-in-law lives in Great Britain. And they flew across the pond to go visit her father-in-law. And while they were there, her father-in-law said something very strange, and he said it more than one time. He said, when I die, a wee little bird will appear in your house. And you will wonder, how did this bird get in here? And you will know it is a sign. It is a sign from me that I am okay, that I am still here. And every time he said it, Gail would look at her husband and they would think, oh my gosh, here he goes again. What in the world is it with this guy and this little bird? But he insisted, I know you don't believe me, but this will happen to you. When I die, a wee little bird will appear in your house and you will know that I'm okay and it will be a sign. They flew home, years go by, they have forgotten all about the little bird, and one day they hear chirping coming from the kitchen. So they go to investigate, what is this chirping noise? And they find, strutting along the floor, a little bitty brown bird chirping away. He's not afraid, he looks a little bewildered, doesn't know what he's doing in their kitchen, and they don't know what he's doing there either. They look around quickly, no windows open, no doors open, and they have four house cats, and not one of them is anywhere around. Gail remembers her father-in-law's story about the bird, and she looks at her husband and said, could this be the little brown bird, the, little, the wee little bird that your father was talking about? They couldn't understand it, but after several minutes, they kind of corralled the little bird, and her husband was able to scoop it up and pet it a little bit. Gail opened the door, and he carried the little bird outside and let it go in the garden, and they just stood there awestruck at what had just happened. And then they were jolted back to reality when the phone rang. It was a relative from Great Britain Gail's father-in-law had died. They weren't believers before that, but now they're willing to believe because they knew that little bird was a sign, a sign that their father-in-law was no longer on this earthly place, but was still there, was still with them, was still present. That division between the living here and the living there was so thin that he could reach through and give them this sign, this wee little bird. And next week we'll celebrate that Jesus not only reaches through that division, he walks through it to remind us that God is always present with us, that we are never alone, that God never leaves us nor forsakes us, that God is always here. It is a sign of compassion, that God sees our suffering and walks the path with us. Now, isn't that what church is supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to notice the suffering of others? We can't always fix it. We can't make it right. We can't make it go away, but we can see people and we can walk with them. So this week, in fact, right now, Maybe somebody has come into your heart. Somebody is on your mind. Somebody who needs compassion, who needs your presence, who needs a note or a phone call or a visit. Someone who needs you to see that they're suffering, to notice them. Who will that be? How will you show compassion? How will you show up for them? How will you hold the hope for the hopeless like a little bird in your palms? How will you be present and with whom? Amen.